was a chill night, wasn't it miss? A cheery voice piped up beside her. Ludmilla looked to her side, the owner of the voice was a young woman who occupied the space in the hold beside her. Both her auburn hair and light spring blouse fluttered loosely in the wind as she juggled her nursing child from one side to the other. Ludmilla's mantle shifted slightly as she turned, and she offered a smile as she responded. Yes, the river is always chilly, she said, but we're well into the spring now, so it won't be so cold in the Vale. The sound of men and women beginning to stir from the shivering groups that they had huddled into for the night rose as the morning sun finally crested the ridge of peaks to the southeast. On the other side of her, Amelia was putting away the blankets they had brought for the trip, which had ended up being lent to the people around them instead. The woman, along with her husband and child, had received Lyde Miller's. Isn't your first time, then? The woman asked, sounds like you know how things are like out there. I was born and raised there, I've just been away for a couple of weeks. The gods must have sent you to help us, then, her free hand moved in a reverent gesture. I can't imagine how things would have been if we hadn't met you. Thanks again for lending us your cover. It's no problem, a good mantle is enough for this time of the year. I was worried more for you and your baby, it seems most of the passengers here weren't ready for the weather. Aye, seems so, the woman agreed. Don't think we got any warning of it. Ludmilla nodded lightly before she turned away, after which her smile slowly faded. Though she had been entirely occupied recently, she thought that she had adequately covered her responsibilities as an administrator. Now that she was on her way home and able to witness her work personally, however, she noticed various oversights, things she could have done better everywhere she turned, even before she actually arrived in her fief. As the young mother had indicated, the migrants to her territory were ill-prepared for the journey, after a brief period observing the other passengers, Ludmilla figured that they were ill-prepared for life in the Highland Valley as well. She had experienced the issue once already when Amelia first came with her to her home, but for some reason it had never occurred to her to warn of the conditions that the migrants would experience before summer fully set in. Watching her hopeful new subjects shiver in the cold as they huddled together between the cargo in the hold that night made her feel woefully inadequate. That she had even erred in such a simple matter felt outright neglectful in her responsibilities as their liege. She felt a nudge at her arm and looked down to see an early lunch being offered by Amelia. It was a meal prepared by terror, between the food she set out for dining in the manor, which seemed standard for the nobles of the city, and the food that she packed for travel, it seemed that her housekeeper was far more skilled at making the latter for some reason. It was so much better than the standard fare that she often requested her sandwiches and baskets for regular dining over the local cuisine. Ludmilla accepted the offered meal with thanks, and continued to observe the ship and their surroundings. Beyond Amelia, the Lynham family sat together in the hold, Leluvian and Willuvian with their mother between them. There was no sign of always condition having improved since being separated from Count Fassett. The dozen or so other passengers were all in the forward areas of the ship, putting the cargo in the hold between the undead crew and themselves. Ludmilla instructed her maids to not act in a deferential manner towards her on the trip and had them all dress in common clothing to blend in and interact with the new migrants. Three of the families were from the list of prospective tenants provided by Bishop Osteen, while the fourth family was that of a journeyman weaver who had been contacted through the Merchant Guild. There were two farmers, as well as a cobbler, and the four families would eventually join the farming village undergoing reconstruction as more homes were constructed. For the time being, they would stay in the administrative village, using the vacant residences in the hill. There. They would receive orientation for life out on the frontier, as well as familiarization with undead labor. A low murmur rose as they sailed out of the gorge and the vista of Warden's Vale opened up before the passengers. Spring had fallen fully over the verdant Highland Valley, and blossoms filled its flooded marshes and slopes. Ludmilla, as usual, was looking out for changes rather than solely appreciating the natural beauty of her fief. To even a casual observer, her gaze would have probably held a tangible edge. Demi-humans from the wilderness had been reported encroaching on the land, and she focused her attention fully with this idea in mind. A conflicted feeling had risen from within her at the news. Duty had called her far to the west and, shortly after answering that call, other duties demanded her attention in the south. While she relished in her solidified sense of purpose, at the same time she could not be everywhere at once. There was the Adventurer Guild as well, she wondered just how far behind she had fallen and how they would treat her extended absence from her commitments with them. 
A little over two hours later, she spotted the first problem as they pulled into the harbor. Rather than damage incurred by demi-humans or anything overtly threatening, this problem took the form of two tents on the flats where her ever-growing glut of timber stockpiles were laid out. It was something entirely unexpected, and she could not for the life of her figure out why the tents were there. They appeared to be stitched together from a patchwork of rough, undyed fabrics. A few men and women sat around a campfire as the boat sailed by. Ludmilla's puzzled gaze lingered over the group before turning to the pier as the vessel made its landing. Nonna waited at the shore with a clipboard in hand, the tome that she carried everywhere was placed into a small satchel slung over her shoulder. The points of crimson light in her skull did not appear to follow Ludmilla as she hopped onto the wooden planks and approached, instead intent on watching the migrants preparing to disembark. Report to the manor after you're done here, Ludmilla said as she walked by the elder lich. As much as she wanted to ask about the unexpected arrivals right then and there, Nonna had her own work to do and Ludmilla was loath to interrupt the exchange of cargo. Her single vessel was not nearly enough to keep up with the goods awaiting transport, and she didn't want to personally make things any worse. She made her way up the hill, stopping to check on the homes along the way. Upon finding vacant dwellings, one of her fears was put to rest. Her initial thought was that she had somehow committed an error while issuing her orders for me rental, which had resulted in a shortage of accommodations for incoming migrants. Nonna would most likely be able to explain what was going on with the people at the tents. Continuing on her way, she stopped at the warehouse. Ah, Lady Zarodnik, Jeeves greeted her as she appeared in the entrance. Welcome back, the small skeleton in his curious outfit bowed in greeting beside his lacquered black box. Within the warehouse, the aisles of shelves were partially filled, but the absence of dust overall indicated that things were being moved around regularly. Thank you, Jeeves. How are things going here? She asked, have you identified any problems? Inventories are flowing according to the schedules that you've outlined, he replied. There have been no additional demands beyond the projections, though our exports are being severely throttled, we still have plenty of space for storage on the flats below, but I am uncertain if it will be sufficient for the long term. The supply of timber is solely from the clearing being done for the areas slated to be developed into farmland, Ludmilla said. Once we're finished there, the amount you see coming in should be drastically reduced. I don't plan on stripping the valley bare, though I do intend to set aside an area for growing and harvesting trees at some point. I understand, Jeeves nodded. If that is the case, then there should be no problem. Aside from that, a villager who came by informed me that a few strangers had been going around procuring cloth from the residents, I am uncertain what for. That must be how those people below got the material for their tents, have you heard anything about what's going on with them? Unfortunately, I do not, the skeleton shook his head. They have not come to interact with the village inventories at all. As far as I know, they have only been dealing with the human residents. I see. Love Miller took one last look around the warehouse, you've done well so far, Jeeves, don't hesitate to inform me of anything you think requires my attention. Jeeves straightened at her words and smiled. At least she thought he smiled, without flesh it was impossible to tell for sure. His overall image, however, seemed to convey the idea that he was pleased. It is an honor to be of service, my lady, he bowed, have a pleasant day. Exiting the warehouse, Ludmilla continued on her way. Following the ring of hammer on anvil, she soon found herself looking over the space where Ostrik Kovalev continued his labors. The smith was still working out of the portable forge which he had brought with him to the barony but the workspace around him had changed drastically. A makeshift roof had been constructed over a length of the terrace, providing a warm and dry area to work under in relative comfort. Rows of crates filled with charcoal and bog iron were stacked in the spaces leading up to the forge itself, while beyond several bloomeries continued to burn as they smelt in iron. There was also something else in the rear of the bloomery area which she had no idea about. Four children scurried about the area, two boys and two girls, and one of them finally noticed her watching the whole operation as he came out to retrieve a basket of charcoal. He stared up at her with big blue eyes before running over to pull on the edge of Ostrike's shirt. What do you want, kid? He said absently as he continued to work. The boy tugged more insistently, and the smith finally turned away from his work with a baleful gaze. Now listen here, you, I thought I. His voice cut off as he noticed Ludmilla standing nearby. 
Lady Zaradnik, he made to bow, wiping his hands on a cloth nearby, I. There's no need to interrupt your work, Ludmilla said. I just dropped by to see how things are going here. The smith nodded as he turned back to the forge, and Ludmilla circled around to stand across from him nearby. Over the ledge of the rampart, she could see that nearly all of the piles being burned for charcoal were gone. The children continued about their tasks, tending to the clay bloomeries and keeping various parts of the workspace well stocked and clean. From her vantage, she could also see skeletal laborers pumping bellows attached to the furnaces. You've adjusted quite well here, she noted. You've even picked up a few apprentices. With construction prioritizing the farming village, he replied while waiting to reheat the piece he had been working on, I figured I should make myself comfortable here. As for the kids, well, with as much as you seem to be planning on doing so far, I took as many as I thought I needed. I can't say I could have taken any more though, we'll need a bigger space for that. I appreciate your initiative, Ludmilla said. It was something I was going to approach you about sooner or later. Once the first village is done, there should be some time to construct a forge here while we wait for the woodsmen to clear away the next set of fields. Ah, then, about that apprentice thing, my lady, Ostrike said slowly as he resumed working. There's quite a bit of confusion as to how you plan on organizing your tenants. How do you mean? The way you've been running things here so far, how do I say it, he said, it's a, very controlled. For the time being, you're providing for all of the needs of your subjects, food, clothing, sundries, fuel, everything. Nonna goes to visit the farming village twice a day, the villagers put in their requests, then Jeeves has the orders delivered via bone vulture or through a cart with those undead beasts if whatever they want is too heavy. Don't get me wrong, I think it's great, it's all very orderly and clean and convenient, but it leaves your living subjects quite, detached, if I were to describe it. Ludmilla furrowed her brow at the word. The system that she had devised was what she thought would be the best way to organize things based on the means she had at her disposal. Lady Shiltier had noted that it was a unique way of employing her resources, but Ludmilla did not think she meant it in the way that Ostrike described. Her smith shifted uncomfortably and turned his gaze back to the forge. It's, well, maybe it's something like this, he said. The people are used to seeing shortages of things, or the price of services and goods to figure out how their little piece of the world is doing. It's like that basically everywhere I've been. Here, though, here, you ask for something, and it arrives within an hour or two if it's available. You put up goods for delivery, and something comes to pick it up and it disappears into the warehouse for Jeeves to take care of. They see all the timber harvested get carried by their homes and the ship goes up and down the river but they really have no idea what is going on. Everything they do seems to vanish into an unknowable void, and that same void provides everything that they need. She thought over his words again, wondering what she could do to satisfy the lack which he described. Ostrike continued after completing the piece he had been working on, placing a new bar of iron into the forge. It was like that with the apprentices I picked up too, he said. Normally kids follow after their parents' trade, and if their family has a feeling that they might not be able to survive doing the work for whatever reason they'll try and send the kid off to apprentice in something that they think will work out. I was willing to take in those kids because I knew that you at least need this many, probably more, new smiths working eventually, but even so the things I have to figure out, how to provide for them, what to pay them when as they become more skilled in the trade, finding places for them to work. I really have no idea. Their room and board is provided for by you, so is their food and so is everything that they work with. This sort of formless future leaves people really wondering what's ahead of them, and it can be quite frightening to some. You understand that things are currently arranged the way they are due to the availability of goods and resources, yes? Ludmilla said, my ability to provide for the population is limited at the moment, as there is only one ship transporting goods along the river. I need to keep our imports balanced to ensure the needs of the people are adequately addressed, so I can see how it can be perceived as my being, controlling. Even if I were to open a market in the village, however, the selection would be quite meager. Yes, I had a feeling it was like that, my lady, Ostrike replied. The people might understand that things are as they will be for a year or two as well. It might be because they've just moved in, or they're being exposed to new things and getting used to life here but they have the look of being lost beyond their immediate occupations. 
The things that they're used to having as a gauge for how they are doing don't exist, and there isn't anything to show them where they fit within the framework of everything. I see, she said. I believe I understand what you're trying to say now, are you sure you aren't some sort of sage from somewhere? Ostrike laughed, shaking his head at her words. I'm no sage, my lady, he smirked. Just a traveler. Ludmilla left Ostrike to his work, stepping out from under the makeshift forge and into the light of the blazing sun overhead. It was plainly uncharacteristic weather for this side of the border ranges, especially in the transitions between winter and summer, which had the tendency to be overcast and wet. It wasn't any mystery as to what was causing it, however. Due to the slow start on the spring planting season, Lord Mayor had altered the weather slightly throughout the duchy in order to ensure the crops grew and ripened on time. Well, it was slightly altered when it came to the lowlands, but the weather in Warden's Vale had changed by quite a lot as a result of being downwind from everything. Ludmilla's territory only represented a small fraction of the land in the duchy, so she couldn't reasonably ask Lord Mayor to change everyone else's weather on her behalf. Between Lord Mayor's control of the weather and the magic he had cast over the fields once the crops were sown, her oats were easily on their way to meeting the harvest schedule with previously unheard of yields. The implications were abundantly clear to all who bore witness to what would have been considered a miracle in their former nation of Rias ties. Though magic being used to assist in agriculture was not a novel idea by any measure, the sheer scale at which it was employed in the Sorcerer's Kingdom was unheard of. Continuing her way up the village lane, she looked down towards the pier where Nonna was still overseeing the loading of timber. Once the summer harvest was ready for transport, Ludmilla was not sure if her single vessel would be enough to transport all of the grain before the next harvest in the early winter. The most straightforward solution was to build more ships, which was something Clara and Leanne were looking into. A part of Clara's long-term plans for Colin Harbour was to include a shipyard to construct more vessels for the river trade. Another option would be to restore the bridge to reconnect her fief to the rest of the duchy by land. Doing so would be expensive, however, and nowhere remotely near as cost-effective as having more ships. Voices on the terrace below drew her attention, the families that had arrived were being guided by villagers that had volunteered for orientation duties. She watched them silently from above, thinking of the issue that Ostrike had brought to her awareness. Ludmilla wasn't sure if he honestly did not know what he was attempting to describe or simply trying to be polite, but what he had said amounted to there being a lack of purpose and leadership in the fief. In addition, despite its necessity for the time being, her control over the flow of goods made people feel powerless when it came to the smaller elements of their daily lives. With her continual absences from her own territory, Ostrike noted that new subjects were becoming more and more directionless. Thinking ruefully to the words she conveyed to Momon during their trip to Irantal, she supposed that it not only applied to kings, but leaders in general. She still wanted to thank the adventurers of darkness for their help, but she had not seen them since. As for what she could do about the current state of her subjects, several solutions came to mind, some of which would probably manifest on their own at some point such as the arrival of merchants when the population grew large enough. Ludmilla's long-term goals, however, were still relatively undefined. Her personal duties to Lady Shultier did not really suggest what she should be doing with her own fief, and matters regarding taxes and other mundane contributions to her liege would need to be discussed before delivery of the harvest was completed. For the time being, she had settled on finishing the extension of farmland along the valley but, once the golems being used in the capital were free to lease, the schedule would be pushed forward rapidly. She mulled over her options. Seeing that the boat had nearly finished loading, she strolled over to the manor entrance where a death knight stood sentry, as well as, something else. On the opposite side of the doorway there was a giant demi-human with feline features, which was nearly four meters in length. Ludmilla looked from the cat thing to the death knight and back again, given that it wasn't attacking and looked decidedly undead, it should be something she could ask Nonna about when she received her reports. Giving it one last look, she shook her head and entered her home. Amelia, Ludmilla called as she entered, did you see that cat, thing, outside the door? I did, my lady, her maid replied. It was just standing there, and the death knight didn't seem to care so I just went in. Did you hear anything about it on the way up here? No, my lady. I just came in from helping the Lynham family move in next door. I see, how are they faring? Laluvian and Willuvian are ecstatic, they already love the veil. As for their mother, 
she is unchanged, as far as I can tell. Amelia rounded up her skeleton assistants and led them out of the door. Shortly after her lady's maid had departed, Nonu appeared at the door. The elder lich placed several documents on her desk as Ludmilla seated herself. Is there anything that requires my immediate attention? She asked. Not at the moment, no, Nonna replied. Then, what is that cat outside the door? It is a squire zombie, Nonna said. Beings that fall to a death knight are raised as squire zombies under its control. Beings slain by a squire zombie will be similarly raised as zombies under the squire zombie's control. Rather than a cat bringing in its prey to display before its owner, the death knight had brought in a cat. Ludmilla wondered if it would keep happening. I, didn't know they could do that, Ludmilla said. I assume this has something to do with the report of demi-humans encroaching on the border? That is correct, Nonna replied. Several demi-humans of this species appeared on the borders of the field several days ago. A pair of bone vultures intercepted them before they intruded too deeply, but they were destroyed. A death knight then arrived and dispatched one while the other demi-humans fled into the forest. This squire zombie is the result. I don't suppose anyone asked what they were doing here, can we ask the squire zombie? Ludmilla said. They approached in the middle of the night, Nonna replied, and the servitors were ordered to guard the fields. Death knights utilize the corpses of the slain to raise squire zombies, they are not the same individual that was slain. Ludmilla tapped her finger on her desk idly. The undead demi-human outside her door was not of a race she had ever seen before, so it was difficult to speculate as to why they had appeared. Still, the security of her domain, and the border of the sorceress kingdom, stood as a priority, one of her most basic duties. Then they performed their task as instructed. As requested by your report, I submitted the order for new bone vultures before I left the capital, so they should arrive at any time, if they haven't already, were there any more encounters? None, Nonna said. Though the bone vultures are currently the best detection assets we have deployed on patrol duties, they were unable to sense the approach of these demi-humans until after they left the trees and exposed themselves on the fields. This problem was something that Ludmilla was already well aware of. Lady Aura's rough outline of the Sorceress Kingdom's forces came to mind once again. There was a distinct shortage of forces that were capable of reconnaissance work beyond direct observation of subjects with poor concealment abilities. Trackers and other advanced detectors were relatively few, and Ludmilla had resolved to train rangers to make up for the shortfall in her own domain. Perhaps the nation's armies would find a place for them as well. For the time being, however, she was the only ranger in her fief. Was the royal court informed of the incursion? She asked, what did Lady Aura have to say? The report is pending further investigation, Nonna replied. Would you like to inform the royal court immediately? No, I believe you have the right idea, Ludmilla decided. I don't want to waste the royal court's time, minor incidents are my responsibility to handle. Anyways, before we move on to regular business, I have one more thing to ask, why are there tents outside? Several humans arrived without the proper authorization to migrate into the territory, the elder lich answered. Without proper authorization? Love Miller wasn't sure what Nonna meant. Did they stow away onto the ship in the past few weeks somehow? They arrived overland yesterday. As they appear to be citizens, I thought it best to wait for you to render a decision on their disorderly conduct. It barely took Love Miller a moment of thought to understand what had happened. She closed her eyes and sighed, yet another oversight. Indeed, Nonna said. Why must humans move without orders? Such senseless and wasteful behavior. Ludmilla didn't bother correcting the elder leech's misinterpretation of her expression, as it was actually accurate in a twisted sort of way. The sensitive balance she was keeping in Warden's Veil vale depended very much on the idea that people would only appear when she could provide for them. She had no expectations of people randomly arriving overland simply because it was close to unthinkable for common folk to make their way through the previously dangerous routes that led to her fief. Under the rule of the Sorceress Kingdom, travel within its borders was fairly secure unless one went somewhere they weren't supposed to go, at which point security happened to you. His Majesty's undead armies had cleared away all of the hostile elements that could threaten its people along roads both new and old, so independent travel without personal protective measures was something that the people would eventually become accustomed to and expect. I'll speak to them after we're done here and find out what I can, 
she finally said. Hopefully this won't become as large of an issue as I think it could be. The door opened, and Amelia appeared with her skeletal assistants. Seeing her mistress at work, her lady's maid quickly instructed the skeletons to empty their buckets of water before going to the kitchen area to prepare tea. Speaking of immigration, Ludmilla looked back to Nonna. There are several things that should be kept in the ship's hold, just in case the new tenants are not prepared for the journey. Several minutes passed as she outlined improvements to the sparse accommodations on board the ship, as well as updates to be relayed to the manor in Erantel to deliver to the Cathedral and Merchant Guild. This will reduce our cargo volume, Nonna noted. It should only be a moderately sized crate, yes? Ludmilla replied, a little bit of hospitality on the journey will help towards acclimating our new arrivals. Speaking of which, how goes the transfer of citizens to the village? Due to the size of the residences ordered, each home takes roughly a week to build. Between them, the construction crews are raising homes at an average rate of one per day. The waiting time for new immigrants has remained stable as a result, do they really need such large accommodations? These buildings are far beyond the standard cottage size of the other rural fiefs observed in the duchy, not to mention the difference in material and construction quality. I have a lot of space and not enough people, Ludmilla said as she shuffled through the summaries piled through her absence. I am also competing with every other territory for skilled labor in this insane race to stay ahead of the deflating commodity prices. Being so far from civilization puts me at a marked disadvantage. If I want to bring civilization here, then civilization must look like it belongs here. Between the dusty dreams piled up in the manor archives, which consisted of what was in the small locked cabinet where the domain accounts were held, and her own understanding so far of the strengths and weaknesses of the sorcerous kingdom's forces, the layout she had plotted for the farming villages was ambitious, at least if one considered the duchy's previous state as a territory of reis ties. With the availability of cheap undead labor, all one needed was land and resources, which was something the mostly untapped expanse of her fief had plenty to spare. What resulted was a strange concept far removed from the traditional appearance of rural villages anywhere in the region. Instead of a manor to house a member of the gentry or some sort of other human administrative agency, Ludmilla had instead come up with what she in the end had settled on calling a light tower. It consisted of several sections, the main, central part of the complex was an administrative office of two floors where she would station its namesake. The first floor would be used to service the villagers, while the second would house the village archives. Two wings were attached to store reserve undead for the village if required, as well as provide space for future government facilities. The tower itself was 12 meters in height, providing a commanding view of the villages surrounding farmland for centuries. Attached by a drawbridge, which provided access over the main road, was the warehouse office where parcels from bone vultures would be received and either transferred to the storage buildings nearby or picked up by awaiting residents. The village itself was divided into two raised sections, which lay on their respective sides of the main road running through the farming terraces. On one side was the warehouse area, while the other housed the residents, services and essential facilities of the village. A small market square existed as well, but would probably not find any use until trade established itself. Both sections were enclosed in their own respective walls, which were connected to each other through gatehouses that straddled the road between the two parts of the village. Each entrance from the road into those sections also had a small gatehouse of its own. When finally completed, the haphazardly constructed hamlet with its buildings strewn over a large area would be gone, in its place would stand an oddly undefensible farming outpost which rose over the fields. The village would house roughly 200 to 250 residents in its fortified enclosure, a stronghold which stood safe from sudden raids. In any other place, it would be absurd to call it a village, and insanely expensive to construct. The fortifications were intended to shelter her subjects and the village's goods, allowing the powerful undead forces stationed there to focus on eliminating attackers as quickly as possible on the field. With raw martial strength sufficient to handily destroy major cities and other nations being deployed by a single village, Ludmilla deemed it more than enough to deal with anything short of a large army, which would probably become a matter of national security rather than something a farming village was expected to deal with. The village was not without issues, though. As Nonna had stated, construction times were markedly slow in comparison with the much simpler construction that rural villages usually saw. 
Then there was the recent ordinance sent out by the central administration to harden crucial points in national logistics against attacks from both land and air. She also needed to somehow make them defensible against magic casters of the fifth tier. The latter was still something she was studying, slowly developing a grasp on the possibilities and potential applications of various forms of magic. The initial concepts which went into the village were clearly only drawn up with defense against attacks from land in mind. Currently, with as little knowledge as she held in magic and aerial combat, her only solutions involved using brute force to overcome such attackers, throwing what she thought might be effective against various types of intruders. Hopefully, she could consult with Lady Shortier, or perhaps Lord Mayor, over these problems at some point. Beyond this, however, she was fairly confident that it would do what it was supposed to, and word would spread that her fief on the border was a prosperous and safe place to live as the seasons came and went. Besides, Ludmilla smiled lightly, you agreed that the village layout was far superior to those of the inner territories, yes? For all intents and purposes, before the new guidelines came in for fortifications, Nona affirmed. Considering the tendency of you humans towards disorderly conduct, however, I am dubious that the additional long-term purpose of these settlements will work as you describe. The additional purpose Nona referred to was essentially enforced by the limitations of each farming outpost. Each could normally support and house a set population within its walls, so the excess would be encouraged to migrate. Each would hold one of the future schools that Clara had described, as well as facilities to train apprentices in all the trades that went into supporting a small settlement. Ideally, it would raise successive generations of skilled workers with a basic standard education. A substantial portion of these new generations would move out due to lack of space, and the capital of her fief would by then be ready to welcome them. I do not expect everything to work exactly as planned, Ludmilla replied to Nona's doubts, but it should work well enough. Our systems will always be subject to refinement, so we should always be on the lookout for ways to improve on the development of the domain. Amelia appeared from the back of the manor with tea, placing the simple wooden cup on the desk. I suppose that now is a good time to see to all of the petitions around the village, Ludmilla said. Nona. Prepare a list of all the villagers in this settlement that have requested an audience in the time I've been away, I'll hold court in the farming village tomorrow. Amelia, check if the Lionham sisters are settled in, if one of them is available, I'll have her deliver my summons. Taking a careful sip out of the steaming cup in front of her, Ludmilla settled in for a long afternoon of work. Ludmilla was on her fourth cup of tea by the end of the second hour, and she was beginning to think that drinking so much hadn't been such a good idea. Shifting slightly in her seat, she kept a straight face as she continued to address the concerns of her subjects from behind her desk. It was a duty she had assisted in since she was fourteen but, after recent events, she felt amazed at just how mundane it now felt by comparison. We want to paint the skeletons, milady, the housewife standing before the desk said. You want to paint them? Love Miller blinked, I suppose it might make for a colorful sight, can they even be painted, nonna? Such, measures would only be temporary, the elder lich replied from behind her shoulder. They would disappear when repairing damage or simply weather away over time. The vision of colorful skeletons working all over her fee faded. Ludmilla turned her attention back to the stocky, middle-aged woman. Was there any particular reason why you wanted to do this? She asked. Ah, yes, milady, the housewife replied. With all the skeletons around, we're already starting to mix them up. If more's to come, it'll be a mess. It was something she had wondered about, and the answer seemed to have finally arrived. With some testing between her maids, it was determined that the undead laborers somehow understood who was supposed to be controlling them and the overall hierarchy of authority. They would follow parents over their children, shop owners over their employees, Ludmilla's household over her tenants, and so on. The people, however, had no such sense unless what they were doing was distinctly different or separate from the others. While one couldn't command the undead laborers of others if they were at the same level of authority, trying to figure out which ones belonged to who in an area full of identical skeletons was probably quite the hindrance. Roughly 70% of her fief's population was undead at the moment. Every home had also been assigned a single skeleton laborer as a means for every family to become familiar with the presence of the undead and how to use them for various tasks. As with the first batch of immigrants, 
The adoption process was much the same and every household eventually saw their trusty skeletal assistant as an inseparable part of their daily lives. The lease rates for various types of undead labor were still in flux as the central administration continued to collect data on their overall productivity, but Clara had put forward the notion with the royal court that household skeletal laborers should be provided freely as a means to familiarize the citizens and future generations on their use. Deliberations were still ongoing, and a decision was not expected until a more comprehensive picture on their overall value was developed. Since you will have to repaint them eventually anyways, Ludmilla told the housewife, keep the markings simple and proper. If I see something strange painted on one of them. Of course milady, the woman nodded in agreement, we'll try to keep things in line, I'll let the others know. With a swirl of heavy skirts, the petitioner turned and left the hall. A wiry young man in a rough laborer's outfit appeared to replace her, taking off his brown worker's cap and placing it over his chest. A afternoon. Baroness, he bowed, I, er, uh, ah. Uh. Is something the matter? Ludmilla looked down at the list of petitioners provided by Nonna. The man was a journeyman carpenter, currently tasked with fashioning furniture for the new village. He and his family seemed to have adjusted well, and there were no reported issues surrounding them. That is, er, uh, no, nothing at all, he said. She patiently waited through his tongue-tied response. They looked across the desk at one another for several seconds before he seemed to realize that Ludmilla was waiting for him to continue speaking. Oh. Ah, uh, yes, about the instructions your lich handed down to us about the feast day preparations, it said to prepare tables that could be reused for the market there, but there's no mention about style or appearance. The weavers will be making some coverings for the occasion, Ludmilla answered, so you don't need to worry overly much about appearance. Though their first use will be for the feast day celebration, their main use will be as tables for market stands. Keep them simple, functional and durable, if the merchants that come by want something more, well, then I suppose they'll have to order it from the local carpenters. I understand, Baroness, he bowed slightly. Back to work then, I'll leave the measurements with the weaver here in the harbor. The carpenter scurried out of the hall. Upon crossing the squire zombie, he gave a startled shout and jumped backwards, bouncing off of the death knight on the other side of the door. Didn't he notice it on the way in? Ludmilla waited for the next appointment. The door to the hall opened but, rather than another petitioner, Willuvian entered the manor. Ludmilla glanced down to the papers on her desk, there should have been at least two more. Did something happen to the others? She asked her chambermaid. It seems that they've already migrated to the farming village, my lady. Willuvian replied. One yesterday, the other this morning. Ludmilla looked over her shoulder to Nonna. I will add it to the items to be cross-referenced from this point forward, the elder lich said. Ludmilla looked out of the window beside her, it was still mid-afternoon, and it appeared that she had seen to the questions of the harbour's current residents. The sight of the two makeshift tents down on the flats near the timber yard reminded her that she still needed to visit the unasked for migrants. It occurred to her just then that she should have asked her petitioners about it when she had them. She would have to see about their mysterious appearance after looking over several other things in the village. How is your family doing, Wiluvian? Ludmilla turned back to address her maid. Luluvian and I are most pleased to be here, my lady, she lowered her head. Your lands are so beautiful, we far prefer it to Erantel. There is less work here for us at the moment but it seems only a matter of time before things grow to the point that we have more things to do. As for our mother, she is not much changed from when we recovered her from Fassett County. Her health visibly improves, but she is still listless, we do not fear for her life, but recovery may take time. I cannot even begin to imagine everything she's been through, so she may have all the time that she needs, Ludmilla said. You may return to your home, Amelia will send for assistance if it is required. She looked back down to the list of petitioners as Willuvian curtsied and withdrew from the hall. While the unexpected dent to her audiences for the day was the result of an oversight rather than an actual error, it still made her wonder where the limits of the undead administrator lay. It had certainly not been outlined in the manuals. When she had initially encountered them, Ludmilla's thoughts were that they were simply unfamiliar with the specifics in management of human lands. After several weeks, however, she decided that they were simply not experienced with administrative matters at all until recently. Nonna, she said, 
Is the elder lich ordered for the new light tower sufficient to manage the civic administration of the new village in its entirety? Barring oversight such as the one which was just identified and situations without precedent, non replied, administrative anomalies should be next to non existent. Management of the civilian administration, logistics, and the defense of the constituent territory of each light tower are all well within the capacity of a single elder lich, as far as my experience here has suggested. We have barely scratched the surface of what needs to be done here, so there is still much to learn. Can we expect every administrator dispatched to us to perform accordingly? Though there should be practically no difference in the capabilities of my peers, who are all summoned by His Majesty, there is also no precedent to suggest that it may be the case. Ludmilla shifted her seat around to face her aide. Though she could still not get a clear read on her undead features, Nonna appeared to be deep in thought. If you know of any problems that may arise, Ludmilla prompted. Personally, I do not believe there will be any issues, Nonna said, but the data collected so far from the other territories is unreliable, so this assessment is at best founded on conjecture. Unreliable? Have there been problems in the other territories? Adoption of undead servitors has been embraced to various degrees, Nonna replied, due to efforts to balance human and undead labor pools, as well as factors involving religious practices and cultural perceptions. Each territory has enacted its own approach based on their specific circumstances, so creating standards for even basic skeletal labor has been a challenge. The Elder Lich administrators have also been presented with their own difficulties. If I were to describe it simply, they have been injected into existing systems of human administration, and each noble and their vassals have personal styles of rule that are non-uniform quality. Only Callan County has appeared to achieve perfectly seamless integration between new and existing systems, which were already at a high standard. The methods there are still distinctly different from your own approach, which has optimized its labor, administration and all aspects of its planning around the availability of undead servitors. So I guess it really was a boon to be able to start from nothing, Ludmilla said somewhat ruefully. It appears to be the case, yes. The only locations that have been able to roughly mirror your early progress have been the recently resettled areas of the Crown Lands that were raised last spring. Ludmilla made a face. The various elements of development within her domain were supposed to give her an edge in attracting migrants. Though it was presumably for the greater good of the realm, the notion that her ideas would be used elsewhere before she could reap their benefits made at least a small part of her want to cry foul. Does that mean that villages like the one under construction here are going to be popping up all over the territories directly managed by the Crown? While the Light Towers and their fortified villages have received a positive review, Nonna said, it was determined that the resources are not readily available to convert the hundreds of settlements in the Crown territories into such strongholds. Materials found here are impractical to source and not worth the expense of importing. Broader defensive arrangements have been devised instead, using elements from His Majesty's armies patrolling those lands. Then what did they use from the information collected here? Ludmilla asked. They primarily revolve around the findings made from undead labor for farming and forestry, as well as the use of undead beasts for light transportation on the road networks. Most territories do not have major obstacles such as the marshes and yours, so bone vultures are notably absent as well. The villages are managed by human chiefs, who in turn report to the undead administrator assigned to oversee their constituency. I see. Ludmilla placed her chin on the back of her hand, do you think that I went overboard with the design of these villages, then? The goals of your development and the purpose of the lands directly administered by the crown fundamentally differ, Nonna said. While your goal is the rapid development of an urban center, the crown is primarily concerned in the production of basic commodities. They will be allowing the excess population to flow to the city through traditional mechanisms, as improvements to Erantel are still ongoing. The House of Lords has been issued no such directive, Ludmilla frowned, should I be making considerations for this commodity production? I've been entirely focused on laying the foundations for advanced industries rather than expanding basic ones. There has been no indication of such a policy being drafted. As long as the lease for His Majesty's undead servitors is maintained, the central administration should have no issues with their current usage. As Lady Shiltier is your liege, the matter of your taxes is also something you will need to take up with her, they are not the purview of the crown. The last part Ludmilla understood as such, but it was nice to have confirmed. 
She rose from her seat, pushing the chair back under its simple, wooden desk and stretched away the hours of her afternoon audience. Amelia began to move seeing this, preparing for an outing. Then everything is in order for now, I suppose, Ludmilla said, unless there is something else you can think of. When the new administrator arrives, I will be relying on you to familiarize it with how we do things here. Each light tower will report to you, as well as the office that will eventually be set up in the port town here. This is markedly different from the old systems that I am used to. A member of the gentry or a village chief does not administer this many people, nor anywhere near this degree of productivity, so we will both be learning how to make these new administrative structures work. While Ludmilla was quite excited by all the new prospects presented by the advancement of her thief, Nonna displayed the same dispassionate expression as always. I'm curious, Ludmilla said. Are all of the elder liches in His Majesty's administration kept as well apprised of the state of the realm as you are? Those working directly for the central administration may be, yes, Nonna replied, but probably not as well as myself. Due to the contributions that I have made to the administration in my time here, as well as the progress made in this fief, I have become a sort of, consultant for my peers. My feedback is valued throughout the realm. Do you mean to say that all of this information about what is going on elsewhere is due to the other elder liches contacting you to complain? None would consider complaining in their service to His Majesty, Nonna replied. Even the smallest contributions have value, and no effort is considered in vain. The correspondences are for practical purposes, though if one were to use such measures, it could be said that they are envious of my position here. 2.5% more envious? Ludmilla smirked. That should be the figure listed on the most recent assessment, yes, Nonna said, but, at this juncture, I would say what is presented in numbers belies what occurs in practice, 